Uh, I'm Jonathan Friedland. I write for uh, The Guardian, as uh, perhaps some of you know. Uh, but we've got three people here absolutely expertly placed to talk about the uh, subject in hand. Just do a couple of housekeeping things uh, first. We're going to talk up here for the first sort of half, about 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to open it out for a discussion fully in the spirit of, uh, of the open weekend. There are going to be two people around with microphones and uh, we're going to try and get as many contributions and questions, etc., as we can. But straight on to our subject. Uh, the question is, are we facing a crisis of democracy? And the question was triggered uh, really by the fallout from the economic crisis uh, of, that most people date to 2008. And the challenge is that the democratic world has... Uh, faced and many would say has been found lacking in the face of since that uh, crisis. So just to throw out a few examples just to get everyone in the room thinking before we hear our expert opinion up here. Um, suddenly in both Greece and Italy, uh, previously if you like democratic countries, now with technocratic uh, governments in charge, almost as if uh, democracy itself or Democrats couldn't cope. You've had the site over months and maybe years of the Eurozone countries. Again, democracies just seeming unable to come up with an answer to the crisis in their own currency. Meanwhile, uh, non-democracies, China, Russia, uh, etc., apparently more able, uh, certainly in the case of China, uh, to cope. Uh, China growing while everyone in the democratic world appears to be shrinking economically. Uh, and uh, those democratic countries struggling to uh, impose austerity on reluctant publics. And so what it added up to in some of the conversations we've been having at The Guardian is, is democracy itself really in peril here or having great trouble anyway, almost creaking in its attempt to respond? So those are the sort of uh, questions, the terrain we're going to be discussing. And as I said, three people up here uh, expertly placed. Uh, on my right, uh, a special advisor to the UN Secretary General and the Director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. On my immediate left here is Professor Nairi Woods, who is the Director of the Global Economic Governance Program uh, at Oxford University and the inaugural Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government uh, there. And on the far left, appropriately enough. <laughs> You've got to make those ones, yes. I've waited a long time for a Guardian audience to have me on the far that's left. Why, that's why we arrange. Even our seating plan is arranged with that in mind. Uh, the, of course, the former Foreign Secretary and Member of Parliament of South Shields, David Miliband. So here's our panel. I'm sure you're going to want to welcome. Good. So let's begin with you, uh, Jeff Sachs. What, the question is, are we facing crisis of democracy? I tried to sort of set out some of the ways in which we might be. From your perch and your travelling the world in a way that few people in, in, in this field do, I mean, do you think there is such a crisis? I think we're facing a crisis of governance in general. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's uh, only the democracies, uh, though the high-income democracies have a, a particular problem. But nobody is having a very easy time with globalization in general, with the governing when capital is uh, so mobile, when uh, the world's population is so large and still rising rapidly, and when environmental damage is already upon us and we're entering a new era of instability uh, because of uh, climatic uh, and other environmental hazards and shocks. So I think that this is a crisis in general uh, that's pretty serious and that is uh, uh, certainly not solved anywhere. I don't think China's going to get an easy pass on this, uh, certainly not Russia getting an easy pass on this. The high-income countries have an added issue. They have the advantage of being high-income countries with plenty of buffer, but as mature economies in a world of mobile capital, They've also faced a certain kind of stagnation as the poorer countries are catching up, and that's adding to a particular set of challenges. But when you have soaring oil prices, soaring food prices, climate instability, uh, massive droughts uh, that turn into conflict zones, like in the Horn of Africa or like Mali's coup right now, uh, and mass migration, which is making societies much more diverse and much uh, less uh, centered on uh, 
cleared, sh clear shared values. I think governance is very, very tough for nation states everywhere right now. Okay, well later I want to push on whether there's a particular democratic yep. problem beyond just the governance, but from where you sit, Nairi, what, 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 what do you think of, is the problem contained to, uh, all governments have a problem? Or is there something, a particular challenge that democracies are finding? And I thought of that, I mentioned that example of that austerity, you know, publics reject that, they, and authoritarian regimes don't have that headache, they can just impose it. Yeah, I think you put the question very interestingly when you say the technocratic governments that have been put in place in Greece and Italy and other populations looking longingly at China and saying, you know, that's how we want government to look. I think that's really falling into an argument beloved of many economists. And the argument is economics is too complicated to leave to politicians so, and that most of politics is venal and corrupt. And therefore, all any country needs is a technocratic, independent mm. group of economists <laughs> to run the country. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I think... What a beautiful picture. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, alas, Jeff, that that's <laughs> profoundly wrong. And I think that when, when, we, when people say democracy is in crisis, they're, they're usually not talking about what the economists are talking about. They're saying that democracies are struggling. And they're struggling with some pretty fundamental things. They're struggling to ensure that the rule of law is abided by and enforced, including by those who make the law. And that was some of the disaffection in Italy. It was the sense that their elected government, Berlusconi, was acting above the law and not acting within the law. And so what's happened in Italy is, yes, you've had a technocratic government come to power, but it is one that many Italians see as a government which is more abiding of a rule of law. And democracy is not just about being elected. It's about a government that sits under its own law, is accountable to it, and it's about the protection of minorities. Democracy, in no account, is about just mob rule by a majority. And I think it's those elements. So when we look at the Arab spring. Mm. That was a yearning to have governments that sit under the rule of law. It was a reaction against Ben Ali and other dictators who not just enriched themselves but corruptly used the law aggressively for their own enrichment and for their own purposes. And it's that that people are, are, are revolting against. I've, I fully take the point about democracy being more than elections. Mm. But the, those in the European Union, particularly in Brussels, who thought that actually the governments, democratic governments in Athens and in Rome couldn't cope, and therefore they wanted to see technocratic administrations. Mm -hmm. What was going on there? Wasn't there a thought there that somehow democracy itself couldn't do what needed to be done? Well, I think that they were very different situations. I think what happened in Greece is very interesting because you saw a government come to power and attempt to open the books when Papandreou came to power, they opened the books and they, they showed the corruption of the pre previous government and in so doing, inadvertently catalyzed a crisis. Mm. Now, at the heat of the negotiations with the European Union, what we were not told at the time was that the deal that Prime Minister Papandreou was being asked to sign was a deal which would increase Greece's debt, not decrease it. The deal was this. The private sector debt of Greece would be cut in half they would only now have to service half the debt. But hey, the rates on that half of the debt would be more than doubled. In other words, their debt would actually increase. And I think that put Papandreou in a corner where he had really only two options. One was to go ahead with that deal, which I think was wrong. And two was to do what he did, which is to say, I will take this by referendum to the Greek people. And in doing so, I will force the deal out into the open. Mm. And that's what brought him down. So I think they're actually two very different situations, yes. the Greek situation and the Italian well, situation. The referendum is a very interesting point because in a way it was democracy itself that <laughs> flushed this all out. And, and, then, and, and if I could just add I on that point. I want to give David, but very quickly. That, yeah. that uh, when Papandreou called for the referendum, it was Merkel and Sarkozy who said, that's unacceptable. Right. Uh, and uh, that's democracy. Yes. Uh, so it was very interesting and very unsettling. And one thing they couldn't have was a democratic measure. Exactly. So dealing with this economic problem. David, let's come to you. I think the interesting Nairi mentioned the Arab Spring, and that's this other part of this, that as one part of the world seems is yearning and go, take, risking the, its, its life for democracy, here's the other part of the world, the mature democracies, if you like, 
who are finding that it's sometimes a bit lacking when it comes to dealing with crises like this. But what's your take? My perspective on this is that this is a fabulous age of democratisation. And it's a fabulous age of democratisation right across the global village. It's not just happening in the Arab world or in Russia or in China where open societies are providing access to information for better educated populations than ever before. It's also that in our own Western societies, the democratization of political relationships, never mind personal and other relationships, has gone hugely far. What does that mean? It means that the, legitim the bar for the legitimate exercise of power has been raised in political situations, in social situations, in economic situations. In other words, whether you're living in a democratic country which has elections or an undemocratic autocracy, those who wield power have to take more account of those who they're wielding power over. That's why it's a fabulous age of democratization. Chinese call it opening up. It was certainly part of the uh, Arab uh, spring, if you want to call it that, the Arab re revolts. So as far as that goes, I think you've got a, a one-way trend. The difficulty is what Jeff Sachs said at the beginning, which is about governance. And there's a twin challenge of governance, in my view. On the one hand, you've got international problems that go to the heart of the interdependence of nations as well as people. And there is no doctrine, never mind institutions, that are able to take account of that interdependence. The idea for 300 years, 350 years, has been that what goes on within your own borders is your own business. And if you want to abuse human rights or abuse the environment or run a gangster economy, that's your own business and it doesn't really affect anyone else. In the modern interdependent world, it does affect everybody else. Never mind that like your foreign policy might affect mm. others. So there's no, and you see this in, in, the, in the political realm, the foreign policy realm around Syria at the moment. It's an explosive situation, not an implosive one. It's going to have massive effects around the region, but you can't get international agreement about what to do about it. So that's one half of the governance problem. The other half, and this speaks to your point about the Western world especially, is that the, the democratic world is much more fragmented than it's ever been before. Class blocks that provided 95% support for Labour and Tory parties in the 1950s elections in this country, those class blocks have become fragmented. That doesn't mean inequality has necessarily reduced. In some ways, it's increased. But you've got more fragmented uh, political, you've got more fragmented nations, more diverse and fragmented nations. And that means creating a common political conversation, establishing political coalitions is much more difficult than before. Mm. And I always, just a final point, I always uh, smile when people say it's the first time Britain has had a coalition government. Every government in the world is a coalition mm. between the governed and the people. Mm. Because when the people say that's enough, you're abusing power beyond that which is acceptable, the coalition is broken. And I think that's, it's harder and harder to get that coalition that can hold for the, du for the durable long-term changes that in our societies need to be made. But if you were in, having this conversation in Brazil, you wouldn't say there was a crisis of democracy. You'd actually say our democracy is strategic, our democracy is solid, our democracy is taking on the Indians and the Chinese. Thank you very much. Now, do you want to come back on that, particularly this idea that uh, David's first point about interdependence, that actually the old models of democracy or the, the old theories of it were just for this country and then this country and then this country. Now everyone is interwoven and interconnected and democracy is, a bit, is looking a bit sort of as if like it needs to adapt. I don't know. I, I think it's a bit... Um, it might be a little bit of a cop-out to slip off into global interdependence because what about, the, what about the challenges of democracy even here in Britain? The challenge of a government, either government, the previous one or this government, who have actually failed to apply the law. They failed to apply the law to their own banking system. They failed to apply the law to the press. They failed to apply the law to the police. And, and that, I think, is part of the public disaffection with democracy. It says, well, what is democracy? Is it the rules that you can buy if you're very, very wealthy, if you're a Rupert Murdoch or if you're a, or a city group? Is democracy about what you can buy as a set of rules? And is that why they look with some yearning at China and Singapore and say, well, those governments are not democratically elected, but they seem to be delivering more to their population. And in some areas, they seem to apply the rules that they have in some areas. Let's be, let's be careful here. I mean, I, I, I'm not a, sympath a sympathizer with that view. I think every democracy has to keep reinventing itself. And I think, and I'm sure we'll get to it in this conversation, that there are some specific things that this country can do and other countries can do to re-energize and strengthen their democracies. But I think we risk saying globalization and independence makes it all too difficult and governments are buffeted by these tremendous wins that they've set up 
through globalization. I don't believe that. I think globalization means you need smarter, more effective, more responsive government, and I think it can be that. But we should hold each of our own governments to account. Well, well let's be, just pick up on that really specific point. Um, since, David, you're an active politician in this country, there was a question there about democracy right here, not in the kind of very meta sphere of the global politics. Do you think something has been revealed? And I think you were referring to the sort of phone hacking story and News International, et cetera, and obviously The Guardian played a big part in that. Um, do you think that's revealed something lacking in our democratic equipment, even in this country? We've had 100 years of democratic suffrage, but the second chamber of parliament is unelected, and 92 members of it are hereditary peers. So the idea that anyone could say our democracy is so perfect that it can't be improved, that would be a ludicrous position. Of course our democracy is imperfect, but there's a massive difference between saying that wealthy interests buy undue influence, which is Jeff Sachs' recent book. He makes a very powerful case about the corruption, I think it's okay to use that word, small c corruption of American politics by money. And you're gonna see more of that in this presidential election. He makes a very, very powerful case. There's a big difference between saying that and saying politicians didn't apply the law. I mean, in the banking system, it wasn't that politicians didn't apply the law, it's that the laws were inadequate, which is a very different thing. And that actually in the banking question, the issue was the lack of European stroke global regulation. So I don't, I mean, I was with Neri in her first answer, but when she started attacking me, I didn't agree with her. So the, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, um, I, just, 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 I just make, the, uh, I, I don't think it's, I think it's unfair to say it's a cop out. It's, it's that, it's a facet. Of course we want stronger democratic institutions in Britain that do justice to the notion of democracy because our centralized, secretive, et cetera, political system doesn't do that. I'm with that. But you could do that to the nth degree and still have a massive set of problems that relate to an international sphere that is under-democratized, under-governed, and under-thought through in terms of the shared principles that could apply. You said um, the government was not, not applying the law. Rebecca Brooks said to a select committee in Parliament, yes, we're paying police officers for information. That, as I understand it, is against the law. Well, then there will be a, if, there, there, that there's was a to criminal. That Parliament, and yet nobody enforced that. It's quite true. In financial regulation, yeah. I mean, I, it yeah. might be tedious to go into it for the, for the whole audience, but actually there was quite a lot on the law books that was not being applied that could have been applied to make the financial system stronger and less prone to the crisis. So I think... Well, look, if we're saying, in that case, we're not actually disagreeing. We're saying strengthening your democratic institutions and addressing issues of governance both go together. I mean, who could be against doing both? You, if you're saying you want stronger scrutiny, a police... Look, the police inquiry on the Murdoch thing was clearly inadequate. Uh, so stronger select committees, stronger openness. I mean, I'm all for that. But I don't think it's governance or democracy. The big, look, the big, the big battle at the heart of this question is whether the 20th century uh, norm, which was that democratic countries were the most strategic, the most far-sighted, the most able to develop economic prosperity and uh, personal liberty, whether that norm is being overturned in the 21st century when it's the autocracies yes. that are going to be strategic, far-sighted, and effective. Now, to, to hold to the view that it's actually an advantage to be a democratic open society, you have to believe both that democratic engagement and, and openness on the one hand and effective local, national, and international governance systems, what you call smart governance, of course you want both of them. But that is the, that is the argument. One gloss on it, the Chinese are not sitting there saying, we are going to maintain an unchanging 1960s style autocratic capitalism, uh, sort of communist capitalism. They are uh, really struggling with questions of how openness and democratization can be brought in within a one-party state. Let me get Jeff, Jeff Sachs on that. And that the, the, Dave crystallized the, the point there, this fear that maybe the democratic countries are just too hamstrung by their own rules and the autocracies <laughs> can surge ahead. And if you look at the growth figures for the decade before the crash, so even before we were all talking about economic crisis, the EU, the United States, Japan did okay um, it, with growth figures in the low single digits, but China and Russia growth figures nearly twice as high. There is this fear that maybe the 20th century, this consensus that democracy was, was the way to go, and that was the future, 
and something looking different for the 21st century? I don't think that's the point, actually, because uh, those growth figures are basically about poorer countries able to narrow the income gap with richer countries so that there's some process of uh, general convergence. I, I don't think you can make the case that the performance of uh, autocratic governments is any better. And, uh, China's having its own weird moment right now. We're trying to, everybody's trying to figure out, including the Chinese, what's really going on. They just uh, apparently put under house arrest one of the leading figures, and there's a great power struggle underway, and the Chinese themselves can't figure out what, what is happening. Um, so I, I wouldn't put it that way. I'm going to come back to this governance question and, and ask a question, which is whether the role of big money in politics is changing in a very dangerous way. In the United States, I think the, we've always had big money in politics, but it seems that it's become even more damaging in uh, the last uh, 30 years as television has become the means of doing politics. And in America, television means private and it means raising vast sums from rich people in order to have television time. And it is making a colossal mess uh, of, of our politics. And I wonder whether globalization, in some sense, there are many factors going on, but it's the media age it's, it, uh, uh, and globalization has put more power in the hands of wealthy elites than in the past. Because in the US, we definitely went from a middle class society governed by the middle class politics to a society where both parties are really uh, beholden to very powerful and very wealthy interests. And this is the change over the last 30 years. And the American people record their dissatisfaction with this by giving Congress an approval rating of 10 percent, which is statistically not different from zero, mind you. Uh, they're not allowed to give it negative. If they did, we'd be minus uh, 80 percent. Um, so there's something wrong. And Brazil, I would just add, similarly, it's not jumping from success to success in that sense. I think they've lost their 10th minister to corruption recently. Uh, they're just in a cat, but they're growing because of, uh, because of, of this, uh, um, uh, this convergence. So my question, uh, I'm not the practitioner. Uh, you, you get a, a great view of this. Is the role of money, uh, I think it's special in the US, this country seems to be somewhere in the middle, uh, and uh, Scandinavia is just pure from what I can see. Use the wrong qu credit card, and you're out. Uh, and, uh, You've seen you the know. opening episode of Borgen, I can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Guardian reference. Very safe for this audience. Um, but I want to, I want to unless, David, unless you want to go directly with an a response to that, I just want to make it quite, quite um, concrete in, in this way. To, two ways in which people have sort of thought maybe the the, the democratic machinery is not working the way it should. First, the pressure for this austerity around the world is because, not because the public is demanding it particularly, saying let's cut down these deficits, but because the bond markets demand it. So that George Osborne says to the country, I can't do anything else because the bond markets will balk, they won't lend us the money, and our credit rating, etc. And this has been a long concern, and the, this quotation will be familiar, I'm afraid, a slightly X-rated quotation from Bill Clinton, who was warned that he had to trim his economic plans. His advisors told him, you've just got to trim your economic plans. And they explained the point about the bond markets. And he said, quoted in memoirs, you mean to tell me that the success of my program and my re I'm not doing the accent, and my re-election hinges on the Federal Reserve and a bunch of fucking bond traders. That's what he said 20 years ago now. That's and, a and, technical and, economics term. Yeah. Uh. And he was, he, he, he was being told you have no options. It's the unelected. It's the bond markets that seem to decide this. Now, people have lived this in real time in the last four years, really, since 2008. Does that not suggest there's some kind of sovereignty problem? Mm. That the sovereignty isn't we the people, mm. as it says in the American Constitution. It actually resides in those bond markets who decide which countries stand and which fall. Well... I don't go with the view that governments are now merely, um, you know, haplessly bobbing round in little dinghies, you know, and, and the sea and the storm is being created by bond markets. It's, it's governments who decide what their, re what their relationship with which bond markets is going to be. But much more importantly, what we've seen in the Eurozone crisis for the last two years is that governments have not led. At no point did governments give a clear framework and say, this is what we see as the problem. Here is the plan for the next two years. 
that, that we are going to try to stick to. Here is, as it were, the washing line on which each piece of news can be pinned. Instead, governments kept saying, we will have a summit in three weeks' time, and leaving the bond markets in a state of sort of absolutely frenetic sort of anxiety, euphoria, and then every little piece of news that dribbles out would drive the bond markets up for an hour, down for an hour, and create in doing so. It's not just um, you know, a casual observation. Every time the bond markets have been making moves on the sovereign debt, it is costing Spain, Portugal, it's costing governments in Europe huge amounts of money. So it has real consequences. The failure of politicians to give a clear framework has cost governments a lot. So your point is bond markets could have been tamed, in a way, if the politicians had it's laid on... It's not to say they're tamed. It's to say that bond markets are fairly primitive, in fact, um, the way they, they act, react, and digest pieces of information is fairly primitive. If there is a clear government-led plan, they've got something on which they can begin to pin pieces of information, and that will affect the way they react. And I have lots to say about this. First, mm. the, uh, there's a real problem. I mean, Greece is insolvent. Mm -hmm. That's not just a problem for bond markets. Greece is insolvent. So uh, this hasn't been invented. France has not run a budget surplus for 42 years. Right. So there is a real, there's a real issue that should concern you whether or not you're a bond trader. Second, the austerity, the collective austerity that's been imposed across Europe is a political decision. Now, the fact that in aid of it is prayed the specter of the bond markets shouldn't obscure the fact that this is a very dominant centre-right in Europe, 24 of 27 European countries from the centre-right, embracing a pre-Keynesian economic theory and using the threat of uh, debt default as the argument for every country to pursue austerity at the but, same time. But, now, is, hang on, but is Osborne wrong then? If, yes, on he, that point, if, it, he, he, is if he did if he did stimulate the economy and didn't cut the deficit, would the bond market say, that's fine, we're going to lend you money at the same if rate? He said, and I don't credit care, if he said, I don't care about the deficit and we're never going to repay our debts, of course he'd have trouble in the bond markets. But that is not the issue. The issue is to move from a deficit reduction strategy to a masochistic strangulation strategy, which is what he's done. And when you strangle the body economic, surprise, surprise, it loses blood from, and, and stops, stops twi twitching. I mean, it's, we're 0.8% growth in this country as a result of a masochistic economic strategy. But that is a political decision. In Germany, they've just announced they're going to tighten fiscal policy. They're a massive uh, European surplus country. They're just going to tighten fiscal policy. That is a political decision because economics, for all it's dressed up as being a technical question, actually has important political aspects to it. And the fact that, I mean, remember on the Greece point, Britain will become Greece if we don't have the Tory uh, strategy. First of all, Greek debt is three, two to three times British levels. British debt is covered by our own, deficits are covered by our own borrowing at uh, current levels. The maturity of our bonds is 12 to 14 years. In Greece, it's 12 to 14 weeks maximum, sometimes 12 to 14 days. So we're not in a uh, Greek situation. It's a bit of politics that's been used. And what's happened around Europe is the dominance of the centre-right, and let's be honest about it, the weakness of the centre-left. And the weakness of the centre-left is part of this story. I would say a bigger part of the story than just a sort of demonisation of the... Uh, bond traders, because the great thing in the, the temptation in politics is either to blame the voters or to blame the bond markets. And actually, we politicians have got to look, we politicians on the centre left have got to look at why we're we losing elections, which is far more to the point. Do you want to come back on this point and then? Yeah, if David's on the far left of you, I'll be on the far right for a moment. Uh, <laughs> not on the far right. Uh, we're in the dead center. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, uh, I don't want to get into local politics uh, too much, but. Um, I think that all of these examples actually show that governments really are facing a very hard and tough time. Uh, and um, the bond market, so-called, so is a real phenomenon. Uh, David's completely right. Greece was insolvent and therefore taking uh, orders from Germany. Uh, but Germany could not lay out uh, a clear policy also because uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel uh, faces her own incredible complexities of coalition, federal structure, uh, independent uh, institutions, Supreme Court, Bundestag. It's pretty much of a mess. Uh, and uh, all of these issues, I think, are, are real. Uh, and managing austerity is uh, never easy anywhere. Uh, 
the point I would emphasize, though, is this is not a difference of democratic and autocratic governments, because try doing this in an autocracy, you'll get the same explosion. Yeah. You'll get the Tunisia rebellion. You'll get uh, Egypt. You'll get uh, the coup that's uh, underway in Mali right now. It's, uh, this, this is governance, and it's tough right now, period. And, it, it's, and, and the challenges are going to get harder over time. And the question that is, from a policy point of view, can you make sensible, medium-term policies in this very difficult environment where you need a lot of global cooperation to do things, and you need to be able to do things that take time that don't have immediate results. That's hard for any government to do. But you know, don't, don't we risk slipping? I mean, there's an aggregate effect that David's rightly pointing to, which is that if every government in Europe attempts to do austerity at the same time, the effect is a sort of Great Depression effect where everybody drives. If the idea of austerity is that you take economies that need structural reforms, and I think everybody agrees that Greece and Portugal need structural reforms, and they go through a sharp period of adjustments so that they can then grow in a new and more enterprising way, they need to be growing into some market. They've got to have somewhere to sell to. They've got to have, I just was in Tunisia yesterday, having bravely fought their revolution. Tunisia, I now really fear for. Everybody's unemployed. Right. No tourists from Europe are going down there, not just because they're afraid, but because Europe is contracting and contracting so fast. Mm. It seems to me that Europe is relying on China, Brazil, and other parts of the world to grow. And that's not enough. Yeah, I, parts of Europe can grow. And if the whole of Europe does austerity at the same time, it will be at tremendous cost, not just to Europe, but to all the countries that rely on, on Europe. I think, there, quick on this, I, yeah, I think there's a, a more important issue, in my opinion, about government. And that is not the short-term timing of deficits and, and uh, so forth, but rather how large government is, what it does, how you balance taxes and spending. When you have to close a deficit, do you do it by three-fourths spending cuts, one-fourth tax increase, or do you do it some other way? To my mind, that gets to the core of what a society stands for, what its values are, what it sees as the role of market versus uh, solidarity policies through the state, and so on. And I regard those policies as the most fundamental questions asked. What is true is that most of Europe in the center right and right parties view the answer, cut spending, don't raise taxes. That to me is the more consequential question because the countries that I think perform the best in Europe, from my take, are the Scandinavian countries. And they have a very different answer. And their answer is we're gonna tax ourselves a lot, because we want social services, we want quality infrastructure, we want maternity and paternity leave, we want quality childcare. And that, to my mind, is the crucial question, not the short-term spending question. Can I, can you just come on, because there's a very, very important uh, point here. The, the small Scandinavian economies, five to 10 million people, are in a very different position than the 40, 50, 60, 70, never mind 300 million people countries. And I think we, we have to be careful before we generalize from a Swedish, Dutch, uh, sure. et cetera, case. Look, the real truth is that the dynamo of global prosperity over the last 200 years, namely the transatlantic countries, isn't going to be the dynamo anymore. That's there right. is the biggest shift in economic power taking place that's taking place in centuries. 50 million people a year are going to join the global middle class in India and China alone. Six to eighteen thousand dollars is the definition of joining of, of global middle class. That is a shift of power, and the real question is: after a century of Western countries expanding the middle class, you know, every working class person the, in my constituency, they, their dream is that their kids should be middle class, and that's happened for a lot of them over the last uh, fifty or sixty years. The middle class is going to start shrinking. In America, it is shrinking. In Britain, it stopped growing. Shrinking down. And this is the essential strain on the social contract. And that is what we have to come to terms with. Because you can find your niche if you're 5 million people. Although I remember, if you're in Sweden, they're cutting benefits there as well, actually. It's worth remembering. They're cutting taxes as well. Uh, the deeper question is, the social contract for the 500 million people 
who are living in Europe, never mind the 300 million in the let, States. Let, let me just hear all of you just go around once on this last topic, and then I want to uh, open it up. And just to return us to our theme about the, the crisis, the limitations in a way of democracy, one separate subject, I think one of you did touch on earlier on, climate change. Um, that was the, uh, uh, the example that was picked out in a very sort of uh, provocative column by Tom Friedman in the New York Times, who basically expressed the fantasy, if we could be China for a day, he said, if we could be China for a day, we could just legislate all these things that obviously we American needs to do, not just for America's sake, but for the world in terms of renewable, renewable energy and shifting away from fossil fuels, etc. But we can't because our we have to go through uh, democratic machinery that doesn't let us and that there's no climate change bill because Obama didn't even try doing it, President Obama, because it would never get through the Senate. Isn't that an example where if you were China, you can do it, but when you're America, Britain, Germany, etc., you can't. Just pick on that one example. It's here. Each one of you go around with that, and then we're going to open it well, up. Jeff. Look, in the U.S., we're very lucky because climate change doesn't exist in the U.S., so it's okay. <laughs> That's um, I don't know about the rest of the world, but we're insulated from this. Rupert Murdoch tells us that every day. Um, actually, even there, I don't think it's right. China is dirty, polluting, coal-based, and I don't know what Tom Friedman exactly is thinking. Oh, no, he meant if, if we were China today, we could legislate. Not saying yeah, China, China's doing it, well, but if you had the power and authoritarianism of China, you could if you wanted to. Thanks, Tom. I don't <laughs> agree. <laughs> it's more complicated for all governments. There are strong vested interests, uh, and this is a complicated issue because it's really a complicated issue. Time horizon, uh, core of the economy, huge lobbies. That's true in China, that's true in the United States. Uh, it's true in, in, in Europe also, but Europe's doing a better job of it. We, our government, by far the most powerful lobby in the United States, though, is big oil. And, but that doesn't matter, democracy, not democracy. You look in China, they are not taking decisive steps. Now, they're saying the US should do it first, but they have politics just like any, any place Even else. Even non-democracies have Even politics. Even non-democracies have plenty of politics. Gary, it was you who actually raised this <laughs> yeah. idea right at the beginning. You mentioned climate change, and you did mention how the non-democracies are, in a way, more nimble when it comes to this kind of thing, or at least they have the ability to be. Well, yeah, no. I mean, if, if climate change is proof that democracy, democracy doesn't work and the answer is, therefore, we should be like China, you know, I agree with Griff. Wrong, wrong, wrong. What are... What does the example of climate change show us are the things we absolutely now, as a matter of urgency, have to nurture in our democracies and build and use new technology to help us build. The first is information, and we're, we're getting there. Look at what Kenya's doing in information technology. Look at what other places are doing as a way directly to ensure that citizens, voters, consumers have information in an instant way with some reliability. Right? So information one, we've got to nurture that. We've got to make sure that we, uh, that we really use the opportunity that technology is giving us. Second, we've got to mobilise. You've got to mobilise not... And, and people under 30 are mobilising. Mobilising across sectors, getting parts of the private sector together with government, with other groups, to actually keep pushing for the right kinds of policies. That's happening, but it needs, needs nurturing. So it's not just the campaigning of large companies. And if large companies are campaigning, we have to be creative. Do we levy them, as the US does, and require them to fund organisations working in the public interest against them, if you want to use a competitive adversarial system? And then thirdly, we've just, we have to keep keeping our processes open, open to scrutiny and under a rule of law. And that, of course, means our media as well. And the reporting, it's not enough for political systems to be open. They've got to be intelligently reported on. Mm. And that intelligent reporting has to be protected and independent. And that's what we've seen. We're failing on all three of those things, but they're three things that we can change. We can change it as citizens. Mm. We can look to politicians to really push that forward and help that change. So I think those are the things we should do. So China, for climate change, no. China's not doing it itself. And it's not because we lack authoritarian global government that we're not doing anything about climate change. Some journalism is, I would have to say, open and independent, we hope, it's sitting in this building. But finally, David, and then uh, your I, former I, environment I think, secretary before um, you were foreign secretary. Look, there is a terrible betrayal going on. I mean, a terrible betrayal of future uh, generations as well as of poor people in poor parts of the world now. And 
the scale of the betrayal is absolutely extraordinary. Um, why is it happening? I think it's happening in part because it's happening to other people, some of whom are not yet born. It's happening um, in the face of, or it's being caused by processes that have deep uh, interest in, in the current organization of our economy and society right across the world, whether in China or elsewhere. High carbon economics is integral to our mode of development. And that makes it very difficult to shift. And so I, I think that we sh it speaks to your point. It's the ultimate proof mm. that you're right. Because Mary's absolutely right. You need to mobilize people. But they're being mobilized about all sorts of things. And this is a very long-term, complex thing to mobilize them around. You've got to mobilize governments. But they have, the, they have different interests. And America is not going to be very burdened by the uh, impact of uh, climate change. And for those countries that might be, I mean, India is a very interesting example. It will, it will suffer a lot from climate change. But it's got. 600 million people living on less than $2 a day, and it needs to feed them. So that's going to be the priority. And so I, and I, think, I, mean, I, I, don't, I think that you're, you're absolutely right to highlight it as a, as, as the, as a, real, as, as a real example. I know you want to get that, but I'm desperate to bring in people here because we've, it is the open weekend. We've got to absolutely. be open, and we're going to, we have the remaining uh, section of our time. So I'm going to take question, clusters of three questions. You're the first hand up, so you, microphone to you. And is there anybody over here near the microphone over there? If we can pass the microphone to gentlemen there. And we'll, if they, and I'll come to the. I think there's a lady there at the back, but uh, I may be wrong in this light. So let's start with you first of all. Um, we all know that young people are the least likely to vote, and in this country, they've been hit by cuts in EMA and tuition fees going up. This week, the Chancellor seems to sort of do the unthinkable and piss off the grey vote by going after them with the granny tax. Um, do you think that young people, the voting age, needs to be lowered across the board in Europe to re-engage young people? Um, and secondly, uh, David, do you think there was a crisis of democracy in the Labour leadership election? Do you want to answer that last bit straight away? No. Let's, go this, let's get what, what, Can you get the microphone back to the lady there, and then we'll hear the second question that was over here. Uh, yes, you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether. Part of the unspoken problem is that people haven't lost confidence in the political process completely. Uh, when I grew up, I knew what politics was. There was Labour and there was Conservative, and you knew what the politicians were going to do, and there was a sense of leadership, even if you didn't approve of it. The last leader we've had is Tony Blair, who led us into Iraq, and that has destroyed the confidence in the democratic process for a lot of people. Now, I don't completely believe it's gone, but I think there is a question there to answer. Thank you. And the third... OK. The third one is going to be over here. Yeah. Um, we've spoken about rebellions and in the Arab Spring and such like, but what about the Western world? We've seen the suppression of the Occupy movement and recently the... the um, the riots, the London riots, what, is there not, I think there's not a sufficient forum for like ethnic minorities and other minorities to voice their opinions and I think that's affecting our democracy too. Thank you very much. Can you, was there a person just in front of you who wanted to ask a question before? Um, I, just have the microphone ready for the next round. I think you're looking at the Yeah, just have it, not right now, but we'll come to you first in the next group. So this point about civil unrest is important. There have been riots here, and in, obviously in Athens and, uh, and in Spain. Do you want to say something about what that is telling us when people are taken to the streets? And the Occupy movement is a huge part of this story. Yeah, I think it tells us that for a very long period of time, we've been trying to build something called representative democracy. But a lot of people don't feel represented by it. And that speaks to a lot of what we've been speaking about today, which is they either feel that their government has been bought by somebody else or that in some way, or that government has just become a kind of facile show business and whoever's on TV the most is winning or whoever's got the, 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 the 15 bright ideas of the day, regardless of whether they're likely to work, will somehow capture the public attention, capture the television news and, the, and then get more votes. So I think that you're saying something very real, as are those movements. In my view, in every open political system, you can and will and should have people out protesting because they are part of the way that citizens give voice to what they think about the system. Um, and that's absolutely right, and it should be. But I think when, when you see an intensification of that, it's telling us something deeper, which is that there are a very large number of people who aren't feeling represented enough in the system. 
And that's what I think we've got to work on. Do you want to come straight yeah, on? I wanted to come. I agree with uh, that 100%. But I wanted to just ask another uh, question for us and, and We're going for, 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 for everybody. At our own, yeah. And that is, uh, can we imagine that the information technology revolution will fundamentally disrupt how we do government? Because we have representatives because 200 years ago, it took a long time to get around this country. And when Wilberforce went out on his uh, rides to uh, inform people about the anti-slavery movement, it was many, many months to reach uh, a uh, part of the country. Now we have, in principle, ways for people to register their views nearly instantaneously, to comment on legislation, to be blogging, to uh, have uh, group sourcing of uh, crowdsourcing of, uh, of uh, drafting of legislation and so on. It does seem to me that just as ICT, information communications technology, is disrupting every other sector of our society, changing how education is done, changing how books are read, changing how the media work and so forth, it will change fundamentally even the structure of what it means to represent. Because why go through a congressman, frankly, uh, because I don't feel that they're representing me especially. Some Isn't have, there a better way to do this? Some people have built on what you just said and said, let's move to electronic direct democracy, where you yeah. vote electronically immediately. Is that the sort of thing you're advocating? I, I, Not just predicting, but advocating. I, I am saying that something like that should be added to the mix, and we should start putting those things in. One of the most successful of our democracies is Switzerland. It's able to use its very small size and cantonal uh, scale, even subnational, to get direct democracy. And it works in, in a lot of ways. And now we can do direct democracy for other ways. So my answer is yes, let's start adding that to the toolkit. See how it works. I don't okay. know. But I think it should be part of it. Thank you. David, you're going to wonder to that, but I want to hear your answers I'm on should the voting age uh, be low, sir, low? I come back. Sir, I think that Anyone who had any doubts about the difference between Labour and Tory had their answer last Wednesday during the budget, and the idea that there is no difference between Labour and Tory and that politics doesn't make a difference was comprehensively disproved by what the Chancellor did on Wednesday. But the point was about Wednesday. trust, I think. He was saying that the confidence people had that the political process would deliver uh, what you well, I think thought that, it would look, was broken by Iran. My co-panelists my co -panelists have spoken very well about representative democracy being um, under question. Now, I think that part of the delusion or the, 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 the fallacy was that representative democracy was a replacement for citizens' activity of themselves. One of the things I've spent the last 18 months doing mm. is founding a academy, a college for community organizing. We're training 10,000 community leaders to make change in their own communities. It's called Movement for Change. It's not about a replacement for representative democracy, but it's a recognition that representative democracy even cantonal democracy, there are going to be issues that you don't want to devolve upwards and that aren't going to be susceptible to a solution by government for the people. It's going to be a re required engagement in government by the people. And I think that, that, you see, I'm a great believer. Some people think hope brings action. I actually think action brings hope. And it's taking action that makes change, that builds confidence, that engages people in the political process, that builds the sort of Mm. energized democracy that you can see here. I mean, I actually, I support reducing the voting age, but I tell you something much more important. Let's teach politics in schools properly. This whole shame about we can't teach politics, it might be political, uh, is really ridiculous. And you're doing your bit. You teach politics. And I teach politics, school. but I teach A-level politics, so it's A-S level, so it's over 16. But I, I, I think that is the real thing. And we maybe could learn from America on that. I, don't okay, know. And I can see people not... He, uh, David teaches regularly at your old school, have a stock conference. But the, the, the point was, I just want to press you on this, was that the Iraq episode, very controversial, it did break some trust in politics and politicians. Do you accept that? Yes, of course. But I don't, I don't think that is the... I don't think it's corroded a yearning for a democratic politics that works for people. My point is you can't fix representative democracy unless you're willing to address yeah. the weak... You, you've got to address the under-empowerment of people as well as the over-centralization or secrecy or whatever of uh, the constitutional system. I know you want to come back. I just want to get another round if I can fit it in. They're going to show it off a sign and say, oh, look at this. This is so good. <laughs> um, let's have... They're going to show me the 10-minute sign in a minute. It's our little 10-minute rule, Bill. Um, let's uh, start with you. And th is there a hand there? You've got the hand. Oh, yes, you're going to be next, aren't you? So we'll start with you and then you. Yeah. Um, uh, on the subject of 
the disproportionate influence. You might need to hold the microphone a bit closer because we're, recor <laughs> we're recording this whole thing. Yeah. Um, on the subject of the disproportionate influence of money in US elections, I'd like to ask particularly um, Mr. Sachs on your influence on super PACs in um, the elections at the moment and whether you think that it's right that this should be upheld, these contributions, massive financial contributions, should be upheld on the basis of freedom of expression or if it is just um, benefiting the rich at the... Um, expense of the poor, and is okay. it really constitutionally correct? So this is the, we will come back to that. But yep. This is super political action committees, or a Supreme Court ruling said that these huge groups could give money without revealing who their sources of funding were. It was a matter of free speech. You're there. Uh, you go ahead. Could we come back to younger people? Because actually, if you look at the last British election, for the first time, fewer than one half of 18 to 34 year olds voted, which feels quite a tipping point. So could you just address young people a bit more? Okay, and uh, let's um, let's have the hands up again. There's a microphone there, and I see a younger person. So let's pass the microphone <laughs> to you. And I'm going to get one more in before we come bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once every five years, we go to the polling booths and we vote a new government in. And in between those five years, that government's free to do as it will, as the Iraq war showed and as the NHS reforms show. So when the people are against what the government is doing, and the government is able to go ahead with it anyway, doesn't that show that our representative government uh, has a problem with accountability? Wow. Thank you. Right. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to urge our panellists to be quite brief on this so I can get another round of questions into whole fire, but we're going to do these as briefly as we can. Um, I've heard you sort of seeming to do the verbal equivalent of nodding to that diary next yeah, to me. I, I, that absolutely. It comes back to democracy, and I think we're all agreed, is absolutely not just about elections. If you think that just voting once every five years is enough to um, make a democracy function, um, nothing could be more profoundly wrong. Democracies require a constant vigilance on part of all citizens and, and, and institutions that make that possible, right? And that means, as we've talked about, it means really holding your politicians, your companies, your financial services sector, whoever, holding their feet to the fire on obeying the law, making sure the, the law is actually um, obeyed, protecting minorities, protecting representative institutions, protecting access to rulemaking. These are really important parts of democracy. And that's why you need things like a free press to get the information out, to make sure citizens know what's being done on their behalf. Democracy is quite tiring for the citizens. Um, and I, I remember it's um, not long after the Cuban revolution. At first, there was this huge post-revolutionary engagement by Cubans who would go along to it. But it gradually wore off with Cubans saying, look, we're just too exhausted to go along to our local cooperative committee. That kind of engagement, um, you can't expect from people over a long time. But still, if you want democracy and you want democracy to work, you have to work to have the right institutions, but then you can never stop keeping on working on making sure they work for you. It reminds me of the Oscar Wilde line that socialism was doomed because there just weren't enough evenings in the week. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's hear you on um, this super PAC, super political action committees, that since the Citizens United Supreme Court judgment, they can spend as much as they like and no one knows who they're. I can be brief. Are it's are. a complete disaster. Uh, it has nothing to do with free speech. It has uh, everything to do with taking away the voice of average Americans. And when the ruling came down, it was a 5-4 ruling, and the minority opinion by Justice uh, John Paul Stevens was spitting anger. At, uh, it's shocking to read, saying, how can this brazen opinion overturn 110 years of American law? It is completely corrupting of our politics. Do you think there is a, because we're talking about a crisis of democracy, is there a very specific crisis of American democracy? Yes. Given, yes. given that, given what's the dysfunctionality, some would say, of the Senate, what do you think? And then I want to hear David on that. Uh, we have money streaming through politics uh, in, in a devastating way, so uh, don't follow that example at home. <laughs> David, you say, no, I think yes, this is really important. Is there a crisis? What we, we were all talking earlier about the West versus the East, the, West, the, the Western model versus uh, other models. Now, I think that the um, dysfunction of the American political system, the frenetic gridlock of American politics, uh, the permanent campaigning uh, and the 
uh, it's not actually, um, people talk about polarization and partisanship. It's actually, I mean, the Democrats are still pretty centrist by our standards, but the, there's been an asymmetrical mm. polarization uh, has left gridlock. And I think that is a really serious issue now because America, uh, President Obama's done well. He's actually had a stimulus program. He's got his growth going. He's got his employment going. But the debt position looks further from realization, from, 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 uh, from being addressed, than, the, the, than closer. And you know what? Look, the country's spending 18% of its income on health care. That's a massive drag anchor. That reflects uh, a dysfunction in politics. So I think there is an American problem. I don't want to lose the lady's yeah, point, though, about young people. Uh, young yeah. people because Good. look, in my constituency, the turnout was relatively... Uh, small, low, I think it was 53%. Among young people, it was uh, lower. Uh, even if you sort of accept the good reason, personal reason for people not to vote in my particular constituency, there's to sort of take out the personal anti-vote. The, uh, um, the, uh, the, there is an issue, and I think it is about uh, South Shields feels a very long way away from politics. You know, we're 270 miles from London, and the, dis the, the, the way politics is conducted, the issues that are discussed, the sense that whatever people in South Shields think, they don't have the power to affect it, is deep and it is mm -hmm. profound. It's way beyond the sort of, mm -hmm. if you like, the metropolitan mm -hmm. elite. And among young people who see, I mean, the young man mentioned uh, educational maintenance services, university tuition fees, the Future Jobs Fund, a whole array of measures that were actually impacting on young people's lives swept away, that is corrosive of democratic engagement too. And my answer to it is to repower communities rather than just to mess around with the constitutional system. I think you have to engage people in their own politics locally. And I think that is the only way to, to give people a sense of agency, which is what they, they feel they're lacking. Jonathan, can Go I on. just say, Britain's not the only country that is facing that issue on youth and on other... And I think what Britain and the United States have to learn is to, to learn from other countries. And it's quite sad. I don't know how it felt in government, David, but I was speaking to one of your Better former cabinet colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I was speaking to one of your former cabinet colleagues explaining that the school of government we're building in Oxford University really has this belief that we've got to learn from other countries. And he said, well, apart from the United States, what other country could we possibly learn from? <laughs> and I think that's sad. I think we should be learning, whether it's from Kenya or whether it's from, from Brazil or whether it's... Not because any other system is perfect, because they are grappling with exactly the same issues, and some of them are finding much more innovative ways I'm of addressing very them. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I, I found, amongst colleagues in government, an enormous sense that one of the oldest democracies had got stuck and although there'd been massive constitutional reform by the uh, Labour government after 1997, it was addressing, if you like, the superstructure. It wasn't addressing the deeper structure. And I don't think... Uh, you know, Germany, for obvious reasons, had to completely refashion its democracy after the Second World War. Uh, I think there was a real openness to try and understand how different democratic systems... I mean, you mentioned Brazil. There's actually quite a lot of interest in what they're doing there. So I, I, I think there's a hunger inside government to make government work differently. That's not the same as work, making democracy work differently, and I think both of them have a, a relevance and a place. I'm really sorry to those who wanted to get another question in, but I didn't want to cut off that last exchange, which I just thought was particularly illuminating. So I'm really sorry. We are out of time. Uh, unusually, uh, we are being very disciplined uh, in this building. It's not always the case, um, but we are this time. So um, I'm sure you're going to want to, first of all, let me just mention this before I forget it. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs will be signing copies of The Price of Civilization, his new book. I think I'm saying upstairs, but I'm not sure that makes sense. But wherever books are signed, but I'm sure you're going to want to join me in thanking our three panellists, Professor Geoffrey Sachs, Nairi Woods and David Miliband. Thank you. Very good